In this video, we'll be talking about how to evaluate the sources that you find. No matter what kind of source you're using, you'll need to evaluate it for credibility. A device you can use for that is the smell test, created by the media policy organization MediaShift. You think of the source, which is whoever wrote and published the work, their motivation, or any biases or incentives they may have to make a certain argument, evidence, or what they are bringing forward to say that their claim is true, logic, how they are analyzing that evidence to come up with whatever verdict they want you to agree with, and finally, left out, what people, events, or arguments they may be leaving out of the picture that they are drawing for you. For source, you want to consider the author's authority over the subject matter and how reliably they have written about it in the past. For scholarly articles, the author's expertise should be listed somewhere in the article. In other words, what their field is, and where they are a professor or what organization they work with. For popular articles, there may be a bio for the author, or you may have to find the writer's personal website to see what they have published and in what field. Motivation. You'll want to think about the primary purpose someone has in publishing this article. Scholarly articles will often lay out their hypothesis they are testing or their main argument pretty plainly, and some popular articles will too, but all of these will have some element of bias. All people writing on a topic have some amount of bias, but responsible writers will let you know what that bias is. Your job isn't to find a source totally free of bias, but to take that bias into account when deciding what to do with the information and arguments that you get. Remember, just because you agree with something doesn't mean it's not biased. This is an example of a media bias chart put out by a patent attorney running a site called All Generalizations Are False. From left to right on this chart, sources can have a liberal, centrist, or conservative bias, but from top to bottom, they can be classified on the kind of article that they are. At the top of this chart would be original or basic fact reporting from the writer or publication's point of view, the basic who, what, when, where on a subject. In this area are articles analyzing a problem or going in depth on some facet of it from a given political viewpoint. Below that on the chart, you'll see sources that tend to publish articles that do some amount of analysis on a problem, but their primary objective is to persuade the reader to come away with a certain verdict from their perspective. These articles can be written fairly in terms of portraying the problem and the other side's argument with accuracy, or unfairly by leaving out portions of the debate or mischaracterizing a problem. And some articles will be outright propaganda, not at all interested in analysis or facts. These kinds of articles should be avoided unless you have a reason to quote a fringe or uninformed view of your subject. I'm not urging you to accept each publication exactly as it's placed on this chart, but that when you're reading an article, you should ask yourself, what is this article's political bias, and what is it trying to accomplish the most? To report raw information, to analyze it, or to persuade me, and if so, is it doing it fairly or unfairly? Another component of motivation is money. Who is funding a project? A scholarly study should state if any of the researchers or the study itself has any conflict of interest in which case you should look more closely at the evidence presented in the study to see if it is actually credible. You need to look closely at the evidence that a work is using to back up its arguments and see where that evidence is coming from and if it seems credible. You should also take a look at the date of the evidence that is being used and make sure that it is reasonably current to when the article was published. If you read an article from now claiming that internet access is not important to student success, and the study it quotes is from 1993, you'll want to ask yourself why more current information isn't being used in the article and if it can still be trusted. You'll want to make sure that there aren't large holes in the logic of the arguments being used by your source. This is true for things like charts and graphs too. From this chart, it looks like the two trends being graphed might have something in common with each other. But if I reveal that the numbers being graphed are actually honey-producing bee colonies in the United States and Vermont marriage rates, this evidence isn't enough, I'll still have to come up with a logical argument as to how these two things are related. You'll want to consider not just what is in the work that you are reading, but what is left out of it. 
No work is going to be able to consider something from the point of view of everyone concerned in a problem, but responsible ones will make it clear what they are considering and what they are not. But sometimes there are items being left out that should make you reconsider if you should trust an article at all. For instance, if there's an article about why one school has a musical program and the other one does not, and budget is never mentioned as a factor, that's kind of a large portion of the picture to be leaving out. Some good fact-checking tools are retractionwatch.com for scientific articles, factcheck.org for political statements, and whois.com and whois.org will help you see what organization might be behind the website you have found while venturing outside the library's resources. So keep the smell test in mind when trying to decide how to use a source you've found in your paper. If you have any questions about how you can apply this to your own research, please feel free to contact us. We're here to help.